Welcome everybody to our first seasonal weed lab for 2021. This one is called Vicious Villains and is going to focus on identifying and controlling late winter, early spring invasive plants. My name is Ellen J. Cart and I am the chair of the Monroe County Identify and Reduce Invasive Species. That is our local weed group in Monroe County. And I am also currently president of the Indiana Native Plant Society. I also have with me here today uh, another member of MC Iris, actually a couple of members of MC Iris. One of them, Mary Wells, is on and she's going to help as co-host to make sure that everything goes smoothly. So a couple of Zoom basics. I think we're all Zoom experts at this point, but for the most part, please keep yourself on mute so that we don't have background noise getting into the, the audio. Um, if you have uh, questions, uh, I'm okay if you unmute and, put, uh, and tell me what they are, but you might want to use the chat box instead. Mary is going to be watching that and she can let me know when there are questions. Um, and I think that's mostly it. So again, welcome. What I'm going to do is share my screen so we can get started with Vicious Villain. Okay. I'll just double check that, in fact, you are seeing uh, now a PowerPoint that's called Vicious Villain. Um, if you're not, Mary, make sure you tell me. Um, like I said, this is the first of four seasonal ones. We decided that what, what MC Iris normally does here that in Monroe County is we have one big event in person in um, May or June to educate people about invasives. And we didn't get to do that last year. So instead we took one piece of it and we're doing it by Zoom. Uh, the most popular part of our usual event is what we call the weed lab where people bring us their weeds in plastic bags or on pictures and we consult with them one-on-one -on -one, and we tell them what the identity of it is and how to control it. And we've now taken that and put it into a seasonal basis so that four seasons of the year, we're going to do this and tell you right now, what are the invasives that you can be watching for and how should you control them? So that's what we're gonna be doing here today. Before I get into the specifics, just so you know who we are, MC Iris is the Monroe County Identify and Reduce Invasive Species Group. We're a coalition of Monroe County citizens aimed at reducing the environmental and economic impact of invasive species in our county through education and action. And what do we do? have a, a short bit here of, of some of the things, the projects that we have ongoing to help citizens of Monroe County deal with invasive species. You can find all of them just by going to mc-iris.org, a little searching, and you're gonna find these. We do educational programs like this on a pretty regular basis. And we are uh, recording these and we have a YouTube channel uh, at this link where you can look at some of our past educational um, presentations. We provide resources like the calendar of control, it's that we took it from, from uh, Brown County and modified theirs. And now it's many different weed groups in the state are using it. If you haven't seen it, this link is handy. Every control method that I talk about, especially the chemical control methods are on here. So if you miss something, this link gets you to the very quick, easy way to know how to control and when to control each species. We also loan toolkits to people in Monroe County, which is a bucket of tools like a pruning saw and a pruners and a loppers um, as, and a big weed wrench. We have polar bears that you can pull species like Asian bush honeysuckle out of the ground. Um, we also give free invasive surveys to people who live in Monroe County. And there's a link here where you can go to sign up for one of those. Those will start when the snow is off the ground, probably in April. We usually don't try and do them in the middle of winter because it's kind of hard to see all of the invasives then. Okay, so on to the invasive species. And what I'm gonna do right now as I talk, if I can find this and I can, I'm gonna launch 
a simple poll. Um, and if it's in your way, answer it and then move it out of the way because it may be obscuring the, the screen, just move it out. So there's a poll just asking which of these five are you dealing with where you live? So I just thought that would be for some interesting um, information. And Mary, I'll probably forget about it, but if you see that most people have voted uh, at some point, feel free, I think as co-host, you can stop uh, it. If not, I'll get it at the end. Okay, so the okay. five we're gonna talk about, purple winter creeper, English ivy, periwinkle, garlic mustard, lesser celandine. All of them are out there right now, even if they are covered by a little snow. And, Um, these three we're going to talk about together because the control methods for those three are very similar, but it just makes sense to group them. So let's go ahead. Let's start with winter creeper. Purple winter creeper, as it's often known, Euonymus fortunii. It's a creeping to climbing evergreen perennial woody vine. It can grow to 20 feet. I've seen it taller than 20 feet because it can grow right up to the top of a tree and our trees get taller than 20 feet. It's from China, it was brought in as a ground cover plant for landscaping. Many people have it in their landscaping, even if they aren't aware that's what it is. Um, it is found along woodland edges, often in disturbed or shaded habitats, very prevalent in many city parks because landscaping all around city parks has it and birds move it into the park. The flowers you see in the lower right have four parted greenish whitish petals, little spray of flowers, and those turn into fruits by uh, the end of the summer, which have a whitish husk, this outside, that pops open. And when it pops open, it, you'll see these reddish orange uh, arrows inside. Um, this is what uh, it looks like when it is climbing up trees. And an important point we'll make later is that the only time you see fruits like this and flowers is when it indeed climbs trees. Winter creeper leaves are opposite, glossy. They have a shine to them on top, dark medium green. They're leathery, toothed, often variegated, and they often have a light colored vein. If you look in the upper right photo, see how the leaf is dark green, but this middle vein is sort of a light green. Often it almost looks like a slightly whitish stripe. And it's variable because there are many cultivars out there that have been developed for landscaping and you could be seeing any one of them escaping and invading an area. Um, similar species, there is something called the native running strawberry that is fairly common in parts of the state, which is also a euonymus, but a native one. Um, and it's similar in that it is a creeping vine with opposite leaves, but it has fruits that have pink uh, outside husks that have warts all over them. Kind of looks like a strawberry. That's how it gets its name, running strawberry. Um, there's no white vein in the middle of the leaf, and it only creeps. It does not climb up trees as winter creeper generally does if there's a tree available. Now. Here's your first commercial. Buy this guide for $10. The two pages that I just showed you with all of this great information, let me show you where that's from. If you can see my picture here, this is the guide to the regulated ter inv terrestrial invasive plant species of Indiana. It covers 49 different species. And those species are color coded in here. Um, we've got trees and shrubs, which are green border. We've got the vines, which like purple winter creeper, have the brown heading. We've got wildflowers or forbs, which are purple. And finally, we have the invasive grasses, which are kind of a bluish color. So this is uh, printed on waterproof paper, fits neatly in your back pocket. And MC Iris is now selling them for $10. This is 
mainly locally because we have a deal set up with extension office that you send us the money and then extension sets one out for you at their office. Um, but you can uh, check our website on how to uh, order one if you're interested. So that's the first commercial. Get ready for the second commercial. Here it is. Purple winter creeper just happens to be the species of interest this year in Monroe County. Each year, MC Iris chooses one species for our reduce one invasive species challenge because we hear people. We hear it when you say that you're overwhelmed because there are too many invasive species to watch for and deal with. So we try and focus people on some of the most important ones. And 2021 is the year of purple winter creeper. So if you're in Monroe County, we have a deal for you. If you go out and you control purple winter creeper where you live, you get free native plants. And what plants do you get? Here they are. Six different native plants, two sedges, four flowering plants, all different that are adapted to different soil types and so on. So if you're interested in this and you want to learn more about the challenge, go to that website and you'll be able to uh, learn more about uh, the Reduce One Invasive Species Challenge and Purple Winter Creeper. Okay, so that is the first species. Remember I said we were going to talk about three species together, the evergreen vine. The second evergreen vine is English ivy. Now in our area, this is a lot. Okay, I'm seeing a question from Mary. Why don't we show the poll results? That's a great idea. Do I need to turn it off, Mary? Uh, they should be seeing that. If anyone doesn't see the poll results, let me know. I just flashed it just because I wanted to emphasize the that winter creeper seems to be a common denominator for a lot of people here. Excellent. Can you cover what those are, Mary? Because it's kind of stuck on my screen and I can't see all of them. Okay. Um, if you can't, if you can't see the poll, chat, chat, let us know. But I just want to share that 71% voted winter creeper as the, the problem species. Uh, second came in as garlic mustard at 66%. And then um, periwinkle at 49. And then as we're talking about English ivy, 46%. And then 22% are reporting a problem with lesser celandine. Um, so maybe that only 22% are dealing with it, or maybe not everybody knows how to identify. Good point. Thank you, Mary. So I'll stop All sharing right. that poll. All right, perfect. Thank you. All right, so English ivy, which some of you it sounds like are dealing with, is in a, a second evergreen vine. It has alternate leaves instead of opposite like winter creeper, and it has that very typical lobing that everybody is so with English ivy. I think this is one you know when you see it. It also forms dense mats which can displace native plants. It climbs trees like winter creeper does. And when uh, vines like this climb trees, the weight of that in the crown of the tree can make the tree more vulnerable to wind throw, which is a real concern for trees that have these growing on them. And like winter creeper, this species is spread by fruits that are produced on climbing vines. Now, this is what the fruits of English ivy look like. And you may be saying, I have never seen English ivy have fruits. Well, they only produce those up in the canopy of the tree. And so often you don't see it happening, but indeed they do produce these uh, bluish black berries, which birds eat, uh, just like birds eat the fruits of winter creeper, and then they spread them to other areas. And the third evergreen vine is periwinkle, or Dinka minor. This is another one that most people are familiar at. I think that the thing it gets most confused with is winter creeper, because look at how similar it is. It's an evergreen vine, has opposite leaves. They're pretty much egg-shaped. Um, the difference, which I didn't even write here, I need to add this, is that these leaves, if you hold them up and look at them closely, are absolutely smooth on the margin. 
there is nothing, uh, no interruptions on that margin. If you look at a winter creeper leaf, they have small teeth all the way around. And similar to winter creeper, this can form dense mass displacing native plants. Huge difference between periwinkle and winter creeper and English ivy is that periwinkle can't climb trees. And while it does produce flowers, actually what many would say are quite attractive purple flowers in mid-April, um, we have not seen them produce viable seed in Indiana. We don't think they can spread by seed. All of the spread of periwinkle appears to be vegetative, meaning that if you were to rank the threat of these species, most people would put periwinkle more of a medium risk versus purple winter creeper and English ivy a high risk because they produce the, the fruits, the birds eat them and spread them. Periwinkle, if you plant it in an area that is completely surrounded by, say, cement, it's not going to be able to escape, barring a flood or something that rips it out and moves them downstream. So um, it's one that can be controlled a little bit easier than winter creeper and English ivy. Still, um, we have seen in too many places pictures like this. This is Yellowwood State Forest. There's probably easily 100 acres there of um, periwinkle. That is just acre after acre, hill after hill of periwinkle. And where it grows, it outcompetes all of the species that you ought to see in that understory. You know, where's the spring ephemerals? Where's the asters? Where's the woodland grasses? So it is a real concern when it gets outside a landscaped area. Okay. Now, I want to beat on this point just a little bit more. I want to make clear that for both the purple winter creeper and English ivy, the biggest concern, the number one concern is don't let them grow up trees. This is a very common look in the Bloomington area. Many of us know is that the, the tree seems to have a green jacket all winter, right? And what that jacket also has, because these are vertical stems, are these fruits. And the birds come in in the winter and eat those fruits, then fly away and start populations elsewhere. So it's a really important thing to um, realize that the first step in control, and that's what we're gonna segue to now. Helen, before we go into control, um, it might be worthwhile to answer a question that came in from David Parkhurst. Um, why? Why are there two different very leaf shapes for English ivy and then maybe even winter creeper? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, David. Um, let me go back. So look at how different that leaf is from this. What happens, there's a physiological change in the plant. When it's growing horizontal and it's just starting to grow up a tree, it has traditional lobed leaves of English ivy. When, but at that point, the physiology of the vine changes to allow for sexual reproduction. And those vines that are able to produce fruits, this is what that leaf looks like. Now the same difference can be seen uh, for winter creeper, that the leaves on horizontal stems look quite different than the leaves uh, going vertically. Maybe not as quite as different as these two, but people are often surprised that what's growing on a tree is also purple winter creeper because the leaves don't look the same because those are reproductive stems and leaves are different. Um, let's see. Do you have a I couple more a ideas? From... Yeah, go ahead. I see Freya's question about uh, does periwinkle spread by seed elsewhere in the U.S.? I believe so. I think further south and maybe it was west that they have seen seed. Um, I haven't kept up with that. And we all realize with warmer winters, longer growing seasons, that could change here. So I try to hedge my words in terms of whether 
periwinkle can produce seed here or not? We don't think so, but um, it's something to watch. And I see a question from Deb Housen, what's the best way to ID English versus Boston Ivy? And I'm trying to remember Boston Ivy offhand. It's quite a different look. As I recall, um, Boston Ivy has more, is it leaflets? Is it more five leafleted uh, vine? Almost closer to a, like a Virginia creeper look than English Ivy, which is a single leaf that simply has lobes in that leaf. Mary, can you check me on that? Because I, we don't see Boston Ivy around here a lot, so it's not one that I'm real uh, familiar with, but the leaves are quite different. Yeah, I'll try to post a resource. Awesome, thank you. Okay. So control, as I've tried to emphasize strongly to you, Number one problem is when those vines go up a, a tree and produce fruits. So when you're doing evergreen vine control, and we're talking about the three vines that we talked about, if it's climbing up a tree, cut it. That's step one. Um, and you wanna leave a gap where you cut it. I'll show a picture in a second. Um, and this is all because these are the ones that are producing fruit and fruits and spreading this across the area. So. This is, and then after cutting it, we recommend uh, painting that stump with 50% glyphosate herbicide to keep the stump from re-sprouting. So let's look at this tree that you're looking at there. That is winter creeper. That is a winter creeper covered tree. This was at a Crestmont Park work day. Um, we have uh, work days uh, that we do each month. Um, First Saturday work days, we call them, and at different city parks like Crestmont Park, the first Saturday of the month, we meet city park staff there with MC Iris, and we have volunteers help to control the invasives in that park. Well, Crestmont Park has some winter creeper issues. So now you see two of our volunteers under the, the winter creeper canopy, and now you can see the leaves here, that's winter creeper, and they are starting to cut the vines that are surrounding this tree. And here is the, the winter creeper vines, each one about four inches in diameter that have been cut. And the blue is where we have uh, put 50% uh, glyphosate on the stump to keep it from re-sprouting. Uh, you'll notice that we use blue dye so that we can see uh, where we're dabbing the herbicide. You'll see that we have a good gap between the bottom cut and the top cut. That's to make sure that the vine doesn't grow back together. It also makes it a lot easier to come in with your herbicide applicator and dab the stump um, and be able to have a big enough gap to get your hand in there. So this poor tree, here is the after shot. It was a black locust tree. You can see that's the same tree and all of these dead branches here, that's all the winter creeper that has now died. Um, so, the, the actual tree leaves are way up here. That's the canopy of, of that tree. Uh, one thing that we mentioned to people is that when you are um, cutting vines on a tree, uh, don't try to pull the vines off the tree in that first year. Just let the dead vines be there. If you try to pull them off too soon while they're still holding tightly to the bark, you can end up damaging the tree. Give it a year, give it a couple of years, the vines will start falling off by themselves. Once they're loose, then you can take them down without harming the tree. All right, now, once you've finished all of those vines that are climbing up trees, whether it's purple winter creeper or English ivy, it's time to get down to the ground and get the vines that are growing horizontally, forming dense mass. Now, pulling is a method that is commonly used. It's a challenging method, kind of labor intensive, but it can definitely work. It's best done when the soil is moist. 
because the ground will give up the roots more easily as you pull. One technique that I particularly like is to use a sharp edged spade, like is shown in this picture here, and cut a section. So when you start at one end of the section and you start pulling slowly so that the roots release from the soil without breaking, you sort of ball it up and keep pulling. And the edges that you cut with a spade, um, you're not having to continually break those um, pieces or go off on, over there and trying to pull that vine. These vines can easily be 20 feet long. So it helps to have a section to work within. And as you go, um, you can see that this is where I think he had cut a strip here. There's still the winter creeper back here, but he had already cleared this. And then this picture shows most of it gone. By the time you're finished, you have a big ball of winter creeper vine. Um, it's an important to mention that to be successful at this, it's a good idea to pull more than once a year. Once you pull, any roots that are left will put up reef sprouts and they will come up uh, within a month, you'll see the new leaves coming. It's a great idea to go out and get those before they can establish well and then go out and get them say another time during the growing season. The amount of time that you're gonna to need to spend goes down dramatically from the initial pulling when it's just a carpet. The second and third pullings, you're just looking for those green leaves, finding them and getting those bits up. So it's quick and it's really worth going after them so that you have less and less and less to deal with and it, doesn't, it isn't able to reestablish. Now, what do you think happens if this big ball of winter creeper vines stays right there? I think we can all imagine it. Basically, the vines that are there, any that have roots in contact with the soil are going to re-root. So this is not how you want to get rid of winter creeper. And it is really important to know what you're going to do with all these vines so you can properly dispose of them because you will produce a lot of biomass that you're going to have to get rid of safely. So this is specifically focused at Monroe County because we've thought about this a fair amount uh, because we are asking people to control winter creeper and if they pull it, we want them to know what to do with what they pull. If you're outside the Bloomington city limits, one way to go is put it in those piles, wait till it dries out and then set it on fire. That will get rid of it. Uh, they will not recover from that. But if you don't wanna try and set these things on fire, what a lot of us do, this is, this is my preferred method, is that I put it in big black, uh, sturdy plastic bags. I knot them and I let it sit there for a year uh, in the sun outside. And then I open it up and I kind of take a test look at them. I make sure they are all brown, they're all dead, they are all crispy, they break. And at that point, I will add it to my compost because I watch my compost and I'll know if winter creeper tries to get started in it. Or at that point, you can simply dispose of it as uh, uh, um, trash and, and simply send it to the landfill. We've talked with the Bloomington uh, city folks though, the sanitation department, and they want for people in neighborhoods to collect the vines that are pulled in the paper compostable ba bags that they uh, sell to people for yard waste. Um, and the bags then should be left in a central location. This is mainly if you're doing it as sort of a group exercise of more than one house. And the neighborhood can contact the Department of Sanitation and they will come and pick them up. And a note is that um, these bags do cost, I think a dollar uh, to get them from the city. There is now a small and simple grant that is specifically to help fund uh, the control of invasives and planting natives called the FIPS grant. Um, and 
if your neighborhood gets organized, you can apply for grant funds to pay for those bags and other incidental expenses associated with doing these controls. So be aware um, that you should uh, not just put the winter creeper vines back down on the ground because they will surely root and start growing again. Okay, a third method for uh, winter creeper, English ivy, and periwinkle is sometimes called the mulching method, um, the smothering method. Um, so I'll tell you what it is in theory, and then we'll talk reality. Um, the, what is supposed to happen is that you take big pieces of cardboard, the biggest you can find, and you lay them flat on the ground you overlap those pieces at least six to 12 inches to their, between the separate uh, cardboard. Um, and you extend the uh, cardboard six to 12 inches beyond the infestation to make sure that everything is covered. Then you come in with at least six inches of leaf and or wood mulch, wood chips, for instance. And you just pile that on top of the cardboard. The mulch stays in place for at least two growing seasons. And really, it's best to just leave it there permanently. Uh, and after a few years, uh, the cardboard has broken down, uh, the winter creeper underneath is dead, and you can simply dig holes into that composted bark mulch now and plant whatever it is you want in that area. To make this even more effective, Essentially, the deeper you go with cardboard and mulch, the more you have, the more effective it's going to be at truly smothering those plants. So you can add layers until it's say 12 inches deep. It is important to remind people that, as you can imagine, it doesn't work well on slopes. You know, you're like this and you've got a bunch of mulch on flat cardboard, it tends to just go down the slope. And if you're in a floodplain, well, floodwaters will take away all that mulch, it'll float. And this is important too, often winter creepers growing in and around trees in front yards. If you put this much mulch over where tree roots are, you are going to negatively impact that tree. So it's not something you want to do where there are tree roots. So here's the reality. Um, you'll note I have one little picture here um, that I took off the web. I asked, um, the Indiana Invasive Plant Advisory Committee Facebook group, which is made up of just hundreds of invasive plant practitioners in the state, if anybody could give me pictures of before and after using this method of winter creeper killing or English ivy killing or periwinkle killing so that I could share those and no one had any. And we all kind of said, you know, this is not a method that most of us are going to use often because we're dealing with larger areas where you can't um, find enough cardboard to do this kind of thing at scale. Or we're in the woods where you have logs and stumps and rocks and it would be exceedingly difficult to get cardboard flat on the ground, which is absolutely required that there be no air spaces in there or spaces where light could get in. So I got this picture of smothering a lawn, which is the same concept, but um, this is not one that a lot of people use, um, it, it, but for small scale settings, it, it could work. And it advantages, you don't have piles and piles of winter creeper vines to try and get rid of. So it does have that advantage. Okay. Now, we come to the chemical methods of control. And this is called foliar spraying. Before we talked about cutting the big vines and treating the stump. That is a cut stump treatment um, uh, with herbicide. Foliar spraying is when you're taking a more dilute solution of herbicide and spraying it over all the leaves of a plant. As you can imagine, it's a less targeted method. With cut stumps, the herbicide is in one very small area. If you're doing foliar spraying, it's best to really know what you're doing. Um, we have some references on our website um, uh, on how to mix herbicides, because I'm going to talk about 
two percent or three percent and um, this uh, link will tell you how to do a mix like that um, as well as the calendar of control has additional information on the brand names that you can purchase particular types of uh, herbicide uh, and so that's a useful reference and again we have the toolkit what I didn't mention earlier is in addition to all those tools that you hand back to us after we've loaned them to you, you get a big Ziploc bag, should have brought one in, that has all of the supplies you would need to do an herbicide application. There's rubber gloves, funnels, measuring cups, safety glasses, spray bottle, a dabber for cut stump treatment. And that um, Ziploc bag is yours to keep um, if, for if you want to do herbicide control. And so there's a link for that. Okay, so how do you do foliar spraying? Uh, we have someone here, uh, David Rupp actually, doing a spray in Dunn's Woods, uh, wearing a backpack sprayer on his back with a wand. Uh, there's blue dye in the water. All of his skin is covered, long sleeves, gloves, long pants, closed toed shoes, and so on to be safe. When you spray an evergreen vine, here's the big advantage. Because they're evergreen and almost all of our native plants are dormant at that time of year, you can spray it in late fall and winter to avoid damaging native plants. The temperature needs to be over 40 degrees for the herbicide to work. The winds should be less than five miles per hour so that it doesn't move the herbicide spray where you don't want it. Clearly, there can't be snow on the ground. If there's any snow, essentially that's water. And if your herbicide hits it, you're just diluting the herbicide and rendering it ineffective. So you can't do it while there's snow on the ground. Um, also, avoid spraying herbicides during a drought. First, they're usually less effective because the plants shut down during a drought and they're not actively growing. An herbicide to be effective must be put on an actively growing plant. Also, uh, we have found that some uh, herbicides, particularly the one we're recommending here, Triclopyr, um, can move through the soil and impact trees when there is a severe drought. So something to keep in mind. The recommended treatment for foliar spraying of an evergreen vine is triclopyr herbicide, 3% dilution of the full strength uh, version, adding half a percent of a non-ionic surfactant, which is soap, a soap-like solution that adds in so that it covers the entire leaf well, sticks to it, and penetrates the very tough cuticle of these evergreen vines. Now, one thing to note, if you've ever walked through winter creeper, is that this isn't like some little skinny layer. It can be up to your mid calf. It can be deep with many layers of leaves and vines. And that means if you spray it, you're largely hitting the top of the infestation. And those plants will die, but they will then expose that underneath there are still green leaves. So you need to go back and spray again uh, and then watch it and wait till the next year and spray if you see additional re-sprouting. I'll show you an example here. Dunn's Woods is a 10-acre woods on the Indiana University Bloomington campus. And this was a before picture in August of 2012. In mid-August, we sprayed triclopyr on the winter creeper. You can see this is, this is pure 100% cover of winter green. This winter creeper, sorry. This is after a month after we sprayed uh, the same tree here. And you can see that the winter creeper is by and large dead at that point. And the next May, it is still dead. No winter creeper, but we are seeing there's some May apple here. There's a bunch of butterweed in bloom, which is an annual plant and has come into this disturbance. There's not much else. That's one of the real challenges of, of this is that there were no plants to start with. The winter creeper has eliminated everything. So it's gonna look very bare. And that's why we recommend planting. 
Now I showed in the, the pictures earlier that we are offering replacement plants for um, those people in Monroe County who control it. So some good examples of low growing mat forming natives that you could use uh, include a couple of sedges like plantain leaf sedge, uh, Eastern star sedge. I have a lot of that in my yard, love it. Wild geranium, smooth rock crest, wild strawberry, and you get fruit that tastes good, uh, and golden ragwort. All of those have a creeping habit, stay fairly low, and could replace uh, winter creeper. So things to consider once you've got their area. But for those of you in the Bloomington area, if you've walked through Dunn's Woods recently, you know it doesn't look like this. Many parts of the woods look like this again. We were unable to keep up with the control of it. There's still pulling going on at this point, um, but the effort involved in pulling is so great that we have lost a lot of ground. So I have to emphasize that whichever method you choose, you have to expect that for several years, you are going to go back and continue that control method uh, to uh, finally win and, and get rid of the invasive plants. Okay, that is the control of uh, evergreen vine. And I'm gonna pause a second because I'm about to go on to the other species. Garlic mustard is next. So if there are questions right now about uh, ID or control of the evergreen vines, this would be a great time to, to bring them up. I'll pause. Ellen, there was a time, a question, let me go back. Um, about the best time of the year to pull winter creeper um, or just to control it, I think might be worth talking about. Um, so the best time of year to control winter creeper pulling, the spring is fantastic because the soil is so moist. Uh, winter is not great because if the ground is frozen at all, those roots are just gonna break when you try to pull. Uh, and early summer is fine. In the fall, with our clay soils down here, when it gets really dry, it's super hard to pull in the fall of the year. So really spring and early summer for pulling. For the, for the spraying, that uh, late fall and winter, when the temperature and winds are right, is a great time to do it to avoid damage uh, to natives. Um, and the, the mulching is an ongoing method that you can start any time of year, and then you're just gonna let it sit, essentially. For, for a couple of years. Uh, Nicole Martins had a question about um, I use participation in that control effort, Ellen. Um, that particular one back way back in 2012, uh, they weren't part of that, but since then they've been more involved and we've gotten, uh, it's IU Landscape Services are in charge of management of Dunn's Woods and we've had them out helping with removing some of the other woody invasives because they're really good with chainsaws. And the, so those guys came out and got a bunch, dozens and dozens of Ammer cork tree, which is a really strange invasive tree that is taking over Dunn's wood. There are a lot of invasive challenges there. And so they've been much more involved in, and uh, we, we've gotten a good partnership with them at this point. Um, let's see, I see Nikki's question, is it the same treatment for all evergreen vines like periwinkle? Yes, all of those treatments are the same. You can smother periwinkle, you can smother English ivy, um, you can pull it, or you can spray it with the same chemical that I'm mentioning. That's why I grouped them together is because the same method works for all of them. One question that was asked is, if, can we provide a list of all the native alternatives? Um, I think we'll probably be providing that on a resource um, with our Reduce One program. Yes, that is, I just got it up on the website this last week, but it's still, I haven't filed Zilla yet, so it's still on, you know how that works. Um, so it's not up there, but um, if you can just, Mary, if you can just put down the names of them, um, in the chat box so people have the names of the six species that we recommend as replacements. And rec recognize these are replacements that work well in Monroe County, so I can't say how well they'll 
work in, in your area, but they are species native to Indiana. Oh, good question from Erica. How deer resistant are the native replacements for winter creeper? That's one of the things that we tell people. Um, uh, some are more deer resistant than others. And this is a huge issue in the Bloomington area because heavens, we have a lot of deer. And the browse rates uh, in some parts of the city of Bloomington are off the chart. Um, two of them, the sedges, deer typically don't eat have a nice sedge sort of uh, low uh, no mow kind of uh, yard um, that the deer really won't bother. Um, rock stone crop was another one that I mentioned. It's very deer resistant. Deer typically don't touch it. I've heard people say wild geranium is deer resistant. To some extent, it depends how many deer you've got and how hungry they are, but somewhat deer resistant. Okay. With that, I'll go on to garlic mustard. Okay. Uh, garlic mustard, I'm guessing most people are familiar with this one. It has been around Indiana a long, long time. It's a cool season, meaning it does most of its growth very early in the season. Biennial, meaning it has a two-year life cycle. Uh, herbaceous plant, it can grow to three feet tall, I've seen it taller than that, not much more than four feet tall. It was brought in uh, by German settlers really for uh, culinary uh, uses. It can be used um, in salads. Um, you can make pesto from the leaves. It spreads quickly in disturbed habitats. It does very well in moist shaded woodlands, but it's tolerant of just about anywhere out there. Um, it has a, a distinct garlic odor and peppery taste. One way to identify it and separate it from a species that looks similar. The flowers you can see are small white petaled flowers held in clustered racemes. And those turn into fruits that are these long, narrow pods called siliques. And each one will have 10 to 20 black seeds in it. And the seeds can be viable in the soil for over 10 years. So this is what the second year plants look like. The first year plants look like this. They are just basal leaves um, that are largely flat on the ground this time of year. I'll show a picture in a second of what they kind of look like now. Um, the leaves of the uh, uh, second year plants are dark green, yellowish green, coarsely toothed. But these first year leaves are more kidney shaped and they're in this basal rosette of four to eight leaves. The second year leaves get more triangular and are alternate up and down the stem. Here we have similar species. As I mentioned, you can see that the, from the look that this is again the guide to regulated terrestrial invasive plants. Every one of them has, what's the most similar thing you're gonna see out there and how do I tell it from the invasive plants? And, it notes that our native spring crest and purple crest look somewhat like garlic mustard, but the spring cresses have leaves that are irregularly toothed, um, sort of wavy and not like the regular teeth all around the garlic mustard leaves. And of course, they don't have a garlic mustard smell if you crush the leaf. Okay, so this is a more realistic idea of what it looks like now. These first year plants are evergreen. So they are out there right now. And I regularly see them as I'm hiking in like Bloomington woods, they'll catch a look of green. And sure enough, I'll find out it's garlic mustard because we have very few native plants that are green this time of year. If you're seeing green, it often means that it is an invasive, but they can be relatively small. In April is when it really starts growing fast and the, the mounds of vegetation get you know a foot tall. What you're looking for right now is much smaller and flatter to the ground. So how do we control garlic mustard? Pulling is often uh, a method used because it's an easy method to use with volunteers since it doesn't involve chemicals. And this 
can be an effective method to control it if, first off, you pull it correctly. And that means that you wedge your fingers down below where the leaves attach, where this root here, oops, didn't mean to do that, where this uh, root is coming down. There's often an angle there, S-shaped or J-shaped root. That's what you want to grab and pull, because if you pull up here, you'll snap it and it will just sprout more leaves from that point. You'll be effective if you pull multiple times in a season, because inevitably, the first time you go out, you may get 75%, 90% of the plants but you'll trample some as you're going, or there will be some that are still very small and you don't notice them. If you come back two or three weeks later, you will be able to catch the few that you miss. Even better if you can come back a third time and get the last plant. And the idea is you want to try and get all of them. Because remember those long slender pods with 10 to 20 seeds in each pod? You miss a plant and you can have hundreds of seeds hitting the ground. So it's crucial that you thoroughly cover an area and remove the plant. It's also crucial that you remove and dispose of all plants that have open flowers or seed stalks, which is generally from mid-April on. Now, plants without flowers should be just piled on logs or dealt with in such a way that the roots don't have contact with the soil. And that's what they look like now. Um, so they don't have flowers at this time. So you don't, if you are gonna go out and check your land for garlic mustard and pull any you see, you don't need to worry about removing it from the wood. You just don't want the roots in contact with the soil. Often, if I get a big bunch of it, then I'll take that bunch and I'll put it in the crotch of a tree. Just hold it so that it's above ground and it can dry and not re-root. And remember I said that those seeds last for like 10 years? You're gonna have to continue to pull in the same way for seven to 10 years. So it takes consistency and um, repetitive pulling. But if you have enough hands to do it, um, in the area you're responsible for, it can work. There we go. Okay. So now let's talk chemical methods. This is again, this is foliar spraying. This would be spraying all the leaves of the garlic mustard plants that are out there. The recommended um, treatment is 2% glyphosate. And the recommendation is you spray it when the native plants are, are dormant. Light the evergreen vines we talked about, since these evergreen plants are out there right now, if the snow weren't covering them, you could spray them with 2% glyphosate and kill the garlic mustard rosette without harming the native plants. Again, you need a temperature above 40, you need winds less than five miles per hour. And to be real, um, usually people combine the pulling and the spraying. Uh, often there will be a spray the first time and then you go out and now you have maybe 10% of what was there and the pulling is much uh, faster because there's so little left. So it, it can be an effective way to, to do both. Okay, and our final species that is out there right now under the snow currently, lesser celandine. This is a lesser known invasive. And I was really interested to see that 22% of the people in the poll that we did at the start are dealing with this. Um, it is a real, it's, it's a very localized invasive. Some parts of the state don't seem to have any. Bloomington has a surprising amount. Um, yeah, there's the results again. And so lesser celandine was, was 22%. Um, while it's not widely established, it's a pretty distinctive invasive. It forms heart-shaped basil leaves. They emerge in February and March. Indeed, people were reporting to me that they were seeing lesser celandine in December. 
almost an evergreen leaf that was there. But it's in February and early March that they start putting out the new leaves to form this basal cluster. Um, it's in April, usually mid-April, that they form these one inch wide flowers with seven to 12 yellow petals. Um, and this, for those in the Bloomington area, this is College Mall Road right here. Uh, this is Buick Cadillac Drive. And this is the ditch that's between the strip mall on the right and College Mall Road. The entire ditch is completely covered with lesser celandine. This is another picture of it over in the lower left. That's um, the same area, that same ditch. That entire area of um, Bloomington is part of the Jackson Creek watershed. And that watershed is covered in lesser celandine. Um, one other identifying characteristic, and the flower is turned upside down here, and you see these three greenish petals, one, two, three, I meant sepals, three greenish sepals, which are the structures that are under the petals. Um, that definitively identifies this as um, uh, lesser celandine. Um, that separates it from marsh marigold, which is a native plant. We don't have any marsh marigold in Monroe County that I'm aware of, it's not a common native plant in the southern part of the state at all. So it's not like we're going to have some populations here, but other parts of the state do have marsh marigold. Flip the flower over, marsh marigold will not have three green people. That's how you tell them apart. Okay. Now, um, this is what it looks like now. This is my, what it looks like now. The, the leaves are a little bit smaller. They're not as abundant and lush as they are in March and April, but they're still evergreen and they're still susceptible to be controlled at this time of year. Uh, and I mentioned here that it's very abundant in the Jackson Creek drainage uh, here in Bloomington. This is one that we would like to know more about where it is and isn't in the state. So if you do have some, we would love it if you could report that using the EdMaps app, which is how we try and report um, invasives in the state. Uh, this, these are a couple of pictures. I did. A, I started a couple of test plots a few years ago. Um, this was someone on Clear Creek in Bloomington, just south of where Cedar Bluffs Nature Preserve is. Um, this is a Jackson Creek tributary here. And this lawn, that's not grass. That is pure lesser celandine. The darker green square, that's where I did four different herbicide treatments to test um, the uh, efficacy of, of the herbicide against uh, the lesser celandine. And so options. The first option for lesser celandine, a non-chemical method, is the digging. But I need to show you what this plant is doing so that you understand how tricky it is to dig it and remove it safely. First, I got to note that all the control options are complicated by the ephemeral nature of the plant. It senesces and gone, is gone by early May. So it's out there in January, February, March. It blooms in April, and it dies in May and you will not find it after that point. So it means if you're gonna try and control it, you have to do it from now until uh, April when the leaves are evident. The second, lesser celandine has both tubers that are these little structures below ground. You have to get all of those out of the soil. Any one that breaks off will start a new plant. And they have bulbils, which are these little vegetative reproduction structures in the axles of the leaves. Um, so they look like little pointy eggs, kind of. If those fall on the ground, they will start a new plant. So this means, you know, for some people, it just means they shovel up all of the dirt and they remove the dirt um, and just consider that they can't use that anymore. Um, but that is a way to control it. And if you have only a few plants, that can be an option. 
and then they're spraying. And what is recommended, generally speaking, is 3% glyphosate before it flowers, which means that you have to spray it with herbicide before April, which is why we're you know, putting it in this show now that this is one that between this month and next month is the window to try and spray lesser celandine. Again, temperatures over 40, winds less than five. Once the flowers are open, the plants themselves are much less vulnerable to glyphosate. Um, it's recommended that if you can, you do a really early spray, like in February, and that gives you time so that by mid to late March, you could go out and spray a second time for any plants you missed the first time. And the really frustrating thing is you will have no idea how effective you were until next February when you look for the leaves again, because the plants are all going to senesce by the end of April, early May anyway. Did they senesce because they were just senescing or did they senesce because they died from the herbicide treatment? It's difficult to tell until the next year. Um, there are other herbicides. There's triclopyr. Uh, there's things like Milestone, which is a very effective herbicide on many species, um, but really not enough research has been done to really say uh, how effective those are. Glyphosate has been used more. One of the challenges of lesser celandine is that it does seem to follow cre creek drainages, so it is often uh, near water, and so you need to use a water-safe herbicide, and glyphosate does have water-safe options like rodeo or aquanite, all of that is on the calendar of control. Um, and, and some of these other chemicals may or may not have water safe versions. Um, if they don't have a water safe version, it's not going to be very helpful for lesser celandine. So um, that is, I'm nearing the end now as soon as I get to the last sign, and then we'll take all of your questions. Um, if, here's my next commercial. If you want practical experience in how to control these and other invasive species, do join us on our work days here in Monroe County. We have first Saturday weed wrangles, which are each first Saturday from March to November. We meet at a city park. Um, that's the link to volunteer. Um, we do have uh, strict limits on the size and the need for masks and social distancing because of COVID. Um, the, we also have other opportunities. Uh, there are some beautiful trails through Pate Hollow and the Dean Wilderness where there's some garlic mustard and there's some Japanese silk grass. And so we've set up um, like nine different uh, days where you can go. There'll be a trip leader and you just have a beautiful hike and do a little pulling as you go. So you can sign up there uh, for those uh, at the second link. And that is everything that I had to share with you that was prepared. So um, what questions do we have? Let me see. OK, I see one. Um, are there any native evergreen vines to watch for when going after invasive vines in the fall or winter? Not for most of Indiana. I believe that cross vine, which is only found in the very southern counties like Harrison County, I believe it can be evergreen. It'll hold its leaves in the winter. Um, so that would be one place that you would want to watch for that. Um, but elsewhere, I'm not aware of other evergreen vines to watch out for that would be climbing trees. Um, I see one from Susan, do native vines like Virginia creeper harm trees? Not to my knowledge, uh, what I've heard is that largely they stand, stay on the axis of the tree, the main bole, and they don't put out as much weight on the limbs, which is where it can start getting dangerous for uh, toppling trees in wind events and so on. So uh, to my knowledge, the native vines do not harm trees. Thanks for adding that list, Mary, and adding a bunch of other great choices. Uh, thanks for the EdMaps link if you have invasives to report. 
seeds? How does it spread? Oh, and Mary answered that. Yep, it spreads largely through tubers and bulbils, the lesser celandine, but um, we do think that it produces viable seed and it can spread that way as well. Since it's largely in creek areas, it's those bulbs, uh, bulbils and tubers that the flood waters downstream. So once you have it in a watershed, it tends to just fill every creek drainage going downstream. Does glyphosate work on periwinkle? Somewhat, and that's kind of the answer for the other two evergreen vines, uh, somewhat, but it does not have as good an effect as triclopyr does. Glyphosate tends to break do down more quickly. Triclopyr stays active longer, and that helps because there's such a thick cuticle on all those evergreen vine leaves, and it takes time for the herbicide to get through it. Um, I think that's partly why the triclopyr seems to be much more effective than glyphosate at killing evergreen vines with foliar spray. Oh, and Mary said yes, but use the surfactant. The surfactant is kind of the issue and how quickly it can get into the plant. Uh, let's see, have you found that herbicides like scythe can be effective on garlic mustard prior to flowering? Remind me what, sci what the active ingredient in scythe is. Is that an organic one? I'm not sure. If somebody can tell me what the active ingredient in scythe is, I can tell you more about that. Oh, Star of Bethlehem was on an earlier list. It was at one point, and then I realized I didn't have any good pictures, and I didn't have much to say about Star of Bethlehem other than Star of Bethlehem is a bulb plant, and bulb plants are really hard to deal with, um, hard to kill. Uh, the leaves tend to be, in a sense, they're like lesser celandine. They have the bulbs. Um, it means that they're able to re-sprout very vigorously if you attempt to kill them with herbicide. And the leaves often don't take herbicide up very well. So um, the only effective way I've found to deal with Star of Bethlehem is to um, dig it up, honestly, and remove the, the individual bulbs. So I wish I had better news on that. Uh, are ferns affected by winter herbicide sprays? If, if the fern has green leaves, as does um, marginal shield fern and Christmas fern. Those are two of our common evergreen ferns. Yes, they would be harmed by herbicides. So if there are green native plants in the area, you don't want to uh, herbicide, get herbicide on them. Is that, sorry, I have to ask, um, Triclopyr is specific to broadleaves. Are they gonna be affecting mm. ferns or is it mostly just glyphosate? I don't know. I. Ferns aren't, ferns as spore producing primitive plants are neither monocot nor dicot, which is how they usually talk about which herbicides are effective on which of those two major um, orders. So I'm not sure what would or wouldn't affect a fern. I wouldn't take a chance with it, I guess. If you, if you value the fern, Okay, um, let's see. I have vines that grow amazingly rapidly with heart-shaped leaves, and I believe these give off a thousand tiny potatoes. Advice for getting rid of these. You have my empathy. That's air potato or cinnamon vine, um, Diascorea polystachia. So it's closely related to our native wild yam. The leaves look similar. You're right, heart-shaped parallel veins, but in the axles of those leaves are little potatoes uh, that are uh, propagate, uh, vegetative propagation method. And when those air potatoes hit the ground, they sprout and start new plants. Um, the best I think you can do is, is to, as, as I haven't done a lot of control with it, 
but the air potatoes seem to develop during the season. So when the leaves first come out, the air potatoes are not hanging on the plant already. If you can spray with say a two or 3% glyphosate solution, the air potato leaves at that point and kill them, they won't be able to produce the potatoes and you won't have to try and get rid of those. Reality is if it's been there for a while, year after year, you know, there may be air potatoes on the ground that will still sprout after you've controlled the vine itself. Um, it, it, it can be a difficult one to get rid of, but basically get started. And the more that you can pull those vines down, dig them out, I'm not sure how good digging is um, because I think it's got a pretty good root system, but uh, spraying the leaves will kill the vine and then just deal with the air potatoes that are left. Uh, other questions? When spraying, can you harm saplings? Great question, Mickey. So if you are doing a foliar spray with a glyphosate, say, um, like we recommend for, for garlic mustard. Glyphosate cannot penetrate bark. Um, so glyphosate on, you know, a brown bark is not going to harm that species. Triclopyr, um, because it, it's not likely to. There are two formulations of triclopyr. The amine, which will not go through the bark, the ester, triclopyr ester, which has more of ability to move. Um, I, would I would avoid getting triclopyr on bark just on principle. Really, I'd avoid getting any herbicide on the bark of a tree you don't want to kill just because you don't want to use herbicide that's not necessary. Um, but in general, it's not going to have a big impact on anything other than a cut stem, or a green leaf. That's what the herbicides will be effective on. Oh, Priya, thank you. The scythe is organic. It's pelargonic acid from um, geraniums, I think that is. Um, I don't know. I have not used uh, scythe uh, or pelargonic acid um, as an alternative to uh, other chemical methods. The only things I've used are like uh, vinegar, uh, acetic acid, citric acid, um, and those are not generally effective on perennials. Uh, they tend to kill the leaf that they touch. It's a, it's a contact herbicide, and I'm guessing pelargonic acid is also a contact herbicide. And that means that you'll kill the leaves that you touch but the roots are still fine. So if it's a perennial with a good root system, it simply re-sprouts. So it would mean doing that over and over and over again. And at that point, to me, it just seems like, just cut it. I mean, that's a contact herbicide is exactly the physiological equivalent of cutting the plant. You've just killed the top part and not impacted the roots. The reason most people use the chemicals that I'm talking about is they're what's called a systemic herbicide. So when it goes on the leaf, it doesn't kill the leaf. It goes in, it translocates through the leaf to the stem, down into the roots, and it kills the roots. And that's why they're so effective at actually killing the plant. So I don't have personal experience with the pelargonic acid, but I'm guessing that it would not be very effective on perennials. Um, Will triclopyr last in the soil? Uh, triclopyr will last in the soil um, at least a couple months. Uh, and I think it, it potentially can be longer than that, um, but it's generally not going to translocate into another plant and kill that plant. As I mentioned during a severe drought, there have been instances where uh, triclopyr in the soil did get to tree roots and potentially could kill the tree. Um, 
but we don't see that happening often. It takes a lot of triclopyr and a severe drought, it seems, to have that happen. Um, let's see. Gosh, there's lots of questions. Not sure we can get through all of them, but let's see. We had bindweed from a bad batch of compost. Any thoughts? Um, this is a good point, an increasing point. We're struggling with this in Bloomington right now because our main compost maker, like where the city takes their uh, uh, material, um, their process may not actually be good enough to kill weed seed, may not be good enough to kill weed vines. Um, and that means that the compost coming from there could indeed start a new population. And that's a great concern. And at the least, when you're getting compost, you should ask the vendor, you know, can you assure me that there aren't going to be invasives? Can you tell me where the material is coming from? What's the likelihood that there are Asian bush honeysuckle fruits in here? Um, it's a real concern uh, that I'm that I'm not sure the compost vendors have really taken on yet. And that reminds me of something that I told uh, people I was going to say. One of, the, one of the things we talked about is the importance of disposing of uh, the pulled winter creeper vines or English ivy vines correctly. And we gave you the options and so on. The number one thing not to do with them is dump them on someone else's land. Um, and, and it's a common thing. I used to work for the Nature Conservancy and manage nature preserves. And um, the people that lived around the preserve would take all their yard waste and dump it in the preserve. And I know that happens in our city parks here in Bloomington too. And then they watch as the winter creeper clippings that got dumped there start taking over the city park. So be aware that, that um, dumping yard waste, uh, disposing of it in, in ways of like that, putting it on someone else's land, completely inappropriate. So just a, just a warning. Is it too early to bring up Creeping Charlie? Um, not, I wouldn't consider this prime time to hit it. Um, I feel like it really starts kicking into gear more in late March, April. So it's one that I would think of as more a spring control as you're starting to clean up your landscape beds, um, pulling or spraying it. Um, right now, I know I don't have a lot showing in, in my yard, but it, it is a weed that we should address in a, in a weed lab. Um, oh, Martha Nyakos asks, uh, so much of the wild mustard, I'm assuming you mean garlic mustard there, is in my grass. It doesn't often grow in grass. There might be another mustard that you're, you're looking at there. There's a bitter crest that can be very common in, in lawn. But anyway, how harmful is glyphosate on grass? It would kill grass. Glyphosate kills all green that it touches. It is not specific at all. So some people, when killing uh, garlic mustard, if there are grasses or sedges nearby that you want to protect, you can use two or three percent triclopyr because it is broadly specific and will kill the garlic mustard and leave the grass and sedge untouched. So that's an option if you want to be a little bit more selective. One, just to chime in, I've had a few uh, people um, ask me about wild mustard, and I think a lot of times people confuse uh, our native wild mustards like. Uh, butterweed uh, as uh, wild mustard. So if it's got a yellow flower, it's not garlic mustard. Um, yeah. Good point, Mary. There, there's so many mustards out there, right? Um, and some are native and great, and some are non-native, and some are invasive. Garlic mustard is invasive, but remember it has the white flowers, long skinny pods. There's a bright yellow flowered mustard called winter crest or yellow rocket that's very common everywhere. Rarely gets that dense though. The problem with most of the invasives we, we focus on are that they form dense monocultures and that's why they're such a threat. 
So it's important to know which mustard you have before you start killing it, because there are some great spring mustards, important for our butterflies, uh, especially in the Pyridae family. So if you have questions, um, another commercial, if you're not part of the Indiana Native Plant Society's Facebook group, join us. We have 18,000 people there. And if you have a picture of a mustard and you want us to identify it, just post it there and you'll have people let you know what specific species of mustard you have and whether you should be concerned about it and want to control it. Uh, Kateri Tanyan notes that sometimes herbicides volatize, uh, which could harm surrounding plants. Yes, um, especially if you're talking about temperatures uh, above 85 or 90 degrees, uh, triclopyr can uh, volatilize above 90 degrees. Um, it tends to be more of an issue because once it volatilizes, it then diffuses out. And it, as far as I know, doesn't generally impact other plants a lot but it can impact the person that's standing there. So most people don't do herbicide, especially with triclopyr or 2,4-D, which is also a big volatizing one, um, above 90 degrees uh, because of that chance of inhaling it. Uh, below that temperature, most of the chemicals we use don't really volatilize. Yes, and Mary is asking, good question, can we share all this chat info with all the links? Yes, I, I'm pretty sure once this is recorded and put on our YouTube channel that we can also include the chat. I'll make that happen one way or another. Uh, let's see. Other questions? I've probably missed some. So if I've missed some in this long chat and, and you've got a question now, go off mute and just shout it out. Oh, I see another MCIRS member's name in the participants. A shout out to Ann Kamen, who's uh, been a long time MCIRS member, um, been active in for years and on many of our volunteer days. So. Glad she's with us today. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, then I think we'll bring it to a um, end here and thank you all for attending. I hope you enjoyed this. If you have comments, suggestions, feel free to email me because we're going to be doing this for three more seasons with the suite of species to control at that time. Let us know how we can improve this. Um, but thank you all for your attendance and um, we appreciate your caring about invasives and um, working to control them to the degree that you that you can. And with that, I'll say goodbye. Right. Thanks so much. Yes, thank you.